Father, we thank you that you have not been silent, but that you have spoken most fully in your Son, but also in these scriptures, which point us to him. Fill these words today that your word might come to your people, that we might know you and what you have for us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we come into this new year, it's not hard to feel overwhelmed. Over 8.1 billion people now live on the earth. That's five times as many as 1900, 10 times as many as when America was founded, and 50 times as many as when Jesus lived. 1,100 Israelis and 22,000 Palestinians have died in the war in Israel and Gaza. At least 250,000 have died in the Ukraine-Russia war, but nobody really knows. Closer to home, over 29,000 asylum-seeking migrants have come to Colorado just this last year. That's three times the population of Monument on the north side of the Springs. Right now, El Paso County has 865,000 people in it. We're adding about 10K a year, so demographers think we'll be at an even million easy by 2050. And if you're counting by ones, each and every one of those people, every single person has big problems, big challenges, big suffering, big need, just like each and every one of us do. Now, if that all starts to tip you into a bad place, you're not alone because it's utterly overwhelming. We don't know what to do, don't know how to handle distress and need on that scale and that scope. So it's not just the problems that are multiplying, the terms for what happens to our minds and bodies and hearts in the face of those kinds of problems is multiplying. Many of us are probably familiar with the idea of compassion fatigue, the burnout that comes from working directly with those in distress, especially for those in helping professions. But there's also compassion fade. Compassion fade is an apathy that sets in when we think about the needs and problems of big numbers of people. We can't handle it, so our emotions just kind of shut down. A term that's new to me lately is the term empathic distress. It's a paralysis that comes from hurting for another person but being unable to help. All of those kind of responses find their roots in this primal fear that there isn't enough, that there simply isn't enough to fix everything, that there isn't enough to care for everyone. And if you can overcome that and you actually try to get in there and like work on things, it often feels that there isn't enough for anyone, right? When you stand face to face with just one person who's struggling in just one way, how often do you realize that you don't have the words to change them? that you don't have the capacity to support them, you don't have the power to save them. In the hardest of the hard moments, we we even become keenly aware that we don't have enough even for us, that just my problems are too big and my resources are too small. We have that feeling because it's the reality. There isn't enough, not in us. But thanks be to God, us is not all there is. Today is the first Sunday of the Epiphany season. The season we celebrate that the light of Christ has traveled to the ends of the earth, uh, to the Magi, but also all the way to us and to our doors. Often in this season, the readings in the church calendar focus on the teachings and miracles of Jesus. In the Gospels, the, the stories of light breaking into that darkness. And, and here at IAC, for the next six weeks, uh, we're going to be marinating in one of those miracles, which was an acted out parable, really, the feeding of the 5,000. Now, this is one of the only stories contained in all four Gospels, which shows how important it is in, in the story of Jesus. But it's also a really thick story. 
There's a lot of characters. There's a lot of doors through which to enter the significance of what's happening here. So each week of Epiphany, we're going to be entering through a different door, through a different character, and listening afresh to the story. And I think it's worth it to spend this kind of time with it because this is a crucial story for us as as 21st century Westerners who are inundated with needs and news feeds because it speaks straight to that sense of overwhelm. Because in the feeding of the 5,000, it felt very much like there was not enough. Okay, let's set the scene. Two things have happened in Jesus' ministry before this part of the story starts, right before this. One is that he sent out the 12 on their first mission trip. Right? They've been teaching and healing in villages all over Israel, and they've come back to Jesus absolutely and completely wiped. But all the people have followed them back to Jesus, and so they just keep hounding them and hounding them and hounding them. So Jesus suggests, why don't you get away with me for a while? He says in Mark 6, verse 31, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. But something else has just happened as well. King Herod has just killed John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin and friend. Not just killed him, but done so in an egregious, horrific, unjust way. Matthew specifically points out this context to explain why Jesus himself is slipping away into solitude. He needs to be by himself, needs space and time to grieve. So verse 32 says, they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Now some of us need to hear this this morning, that life is indeed too much for you to handle. And it's okay to get away from parts of it for a while. In fact, it's more than okay. Those breaks are built into God's purposes for us. They are built into God's law. The Sabbath day, the Sabbath year, the years of Jubilee, the feasts and seasons of the calendar were spiritual disciplines that were meant to create a cultural value, this cultural value of resting in the fact that we are not God. We are finite. We are dependent. We are limited. But there's one who is not. That's why we worship on the Christian Sabbath. We are resting in the fact that someone else is God and not us. And if we cannot stop, if we will not stop, what we are doing is declaring ourselves to be God. And that never goes well. We'll hurt ourselves, we'll hurt others, and eventually, if we continue on that path, we'll eventually put our own souls in danger. So hear this. You are not stronger than Jesus. You need time to retreat with the Father, too. So take it, and don't feel bad about it. But that's really hard, because the needs don't stop when we stop, do they? Right, when we try to get away, the needs often follow us, right, in our minds, on our phones, in our own persons. There is no escape from that need. There is no corner of creation where all that lack just kind of fades away. I, I find that often when I get away, even when I turn my phone off, even when I don't check the news, like when I'm on truly a Sabbath, I just notice other areas of lack that I hadn't noticed before. Things in me that are like less stable than I would have hoped. Lack in those closest to me. Rest primarily trains us to know that we can't fix the problems. Rest doesn't fix the problems themselves. I say that again. Rest primarily trains us to know that we can't fix the problems. Rest doesn't fix the problems themselves. And that's symbolized in this story by the people just continuing to come. Wave after wave. Verse 32 again. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. Imagine what it must have felt like to look to the shore and see these little ants crawling around and realize what's happening. 
parents of little kids in the room are like, that's not hard. That's not hard to imagine that. It's like every time I go to the bathroom, like that's exactly what happens. Right? <laughs> the disciples are so worn out. You've got to, yeah, I mean, they've got to be like, oh, why can't they just chill? But I also think of Jesus. Right? Is there anything worse than having to host people, provide for people, entertain people than when you're deep in grief? Right? There's, there's, there's seasons of grief when you enjoy being distracted, right? So you can just kind of avoid it. And, but, but, but when you're in the pit, when you're a wreck inside, you really just want others to go away. No one would have blamed Jesus for just like teleporting them up to a mountain, right? We're just going to skip this whole thing. The disciples wouldn't have blamed him, that's for sure. But Jesus, the clearest, sharpest picture we have of who God is, of what God is like, performs in this moment what feels to me like the first miracle in this story. He cares. Verse 34, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep are a mess with a shepherd. (laughs) They're extra messy without one. Scattered, anxious, lost, vulnerable. If you take everything we know of the world we live in and you put that picture on it, it's like, yeah, that fits. And Jesus cares. Jesus has compassion. Our English word compassion comes from the idea of suffering, passion, with another, come, like community, come, passion, suffering with. Compassion is an entering into the pain of another. The Greek word for compassion derives from the word for gut or intestines. It's a, it's a feeling of concern so strong, it sits right here. Now we have similar sorts of phrases for that type of feeling. We might say that we feel an ache deep in our bones. We might say that our heart is starting to beat faster. We might say we're moved to tears. It's, 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 it's this uh, tangible, visceral feeling of being one with one who is hurting. And over and over and over and over again in the Gospels, it is a feeling that Jesus has for us. Which means it's a feeling that the Father himself has for us. Which means it's a feeling that the Spirit has for us. I think we can sometimes imagine that God's like a a bigger version of ourselves, that he wears out, that he stops paying attention. But long after we would succumb, Jesus has compassion for all of it. For the spiritual needs, the text says in Mark that he began teaching them many things. He's feeding their need for truth and meaning and hope by giving them good news of the kingdom. But also for physical needs. Matthew and Luke's gospel highlight the healing that he does next, knitting limbs and eyes back together. He casts out oppressive spirits. There's enough care, enough compassion for all of it, for all of us, for all of you. Because you are in that crowd. Your lack, your needs, You're not enough. You're overwhelmed. He sees to the depths. And he cares for to the depths. Now, I sincerely hope there are people around you, family, friends, pastoral staff, life group uh, participants, counselors, spiritual directors, who I hope you have people who know at least a tiny slice of what you're going through like a small piece of the lack and pain and hurt and need that you carry with you. But hear this, Jesus knows all of it. And Jesus cares about all of it. And Jesus' gut is twisted up over all of it. One of the most powerful spiritual practices I know is is to, in your sanctified imagination, in your imagination, look at Jesus 
as he looks at you. Picture in your mind's eye his face staring into yours. And friends, in the midst of whatever you're going through, if you don't see some compassion there, if you don't see some concern and care and suffering because of your suffering, it is not the real Jesus you're looking at. It's, if it seems like he's looking away from you because he's distracted or embarrassed or exhausted or angry with you, you're wrong. There is enough compassion in him for all of it. Where brokenness abounds, compassion abounds all the more. Even in the places you don't realize you're lacking yet, even in the places where you still feel like you have enough, there may be extra compassion for that because you're going to wake up to that one day. And in that compassion, he never, ever stops working and laboring and teaching and healing to rescue you. He has not stopped, and he will not stop. There may be times when even your ability to care about yourself, your ability to have compassion and mercy on your own need dries up. There may be moments when you're just done with yourself. He never is. Not with you, and not with the person sitting next to you, or the person outside these doors who lack, whose lack and need you have been trying to meet and can't? Or the person outside these doors whose lack you haven't even fathomed yet? They're just one of the crowd. They're just one of those numbers. He cares about all of it. And thank God it is ultimately not our compassion that determines the course of their existence. It is His. It is his care and his concern that continues to reach out to them through all manners and means and ways, most of which we never see. Just because you can't be at, a work, in a, at work in a place doesn't mean he isn't at work in that place. You can rest in that and you can have hope in that. The world is not yours to save, it is his. But at the same time, it's also true that his compassion is not his private possession. We are invited into it. Now, there's a way of reading this part of the story that simply says, like, Jesus cares, you should too. But that actually misses who the hero of the story is. And that misses what we're capable of. We are not just invited to copy Jesus' compassion. We are invited into a deeper mystery. We are invited into Jesus' compassion. Friends, you are invited to, to, to make your home in Jesus' concern, in Jesus' care for others. By the Spirit, he shares that compassion with us. He invites us to look into his face, not only as he's looking back at us, but as he's looking at others. He invites us to feel and know the incredible depth of his care for them. This is the only way that hard hearts can melt, that tired hearts can be refreshed, that we get the strength to keep going. And this is why we cannot speak of mission and service and evangelism or, or fighting for justice or, or serving in mercy ministries or, or, or anything that is caring for others without starting with intercessory prayer. We have to start with intercessory prayer. It is our primary practice for staying sane in an overwhelming world. And I don't say that because intercessory prayer is the way we get Jesus to pay attention. That's sometimes how we imagine this, right? That like, oh, Jesus is doing all this stuff out there, and like, once we pray, he starts paying attention. But friends, he made that person. He formed that person in their mother's womb. He carried them and sustained them and has showered them with gifts of life and sustenance and community all the way up to this moment. No one loves them more than him. So when we pray, what's actually happening in the spiritual realms is that God is inviting us to share in the concern that he already has. He is inviting us to groan with his groans for their groans. 
He is inviting us into his compassion for their needs. Our prayer isn't a way to make him care. Our prayer is that he would show his care in a way that could be received. And mysteries happen in that space. Right? I, I, I've been feeling led to pray more specifically lately. Some things that you could actually say, like whether this was answered or not. And, and, and I have seen, my, my journal has become littered with answered prayer, AP, answered prayer. It's been humbling and my faith has grown because I confess my faith has not always been strong in this way to see how Jesus invites us to partner with him in building his kingdom through prayer. But it wasn't my prayers that made Jesus care about this thing. He cared long before I did. He was waiting for me to enter into his compassion, not the other way around. Well, this is why this, this epiphany season, we often invite um, you as a congregation into some kind of spiritual practice. You're free to, to pick up or not, but we want to invite you to. And in this season, we want to invite you into a practice of intercessory prayer. I'm not asking you to make a huge list. If that's what came up in your mind and you're like, oh. We're asking you to pray boldly and specifically once a day during this epiphany season for God to show his compassion, to display his care in a way that can be received for two people, just two. One is a person in your life who you already know. A person who you know needs the healing work of Jesus. Maybe they need his healing in their bodies, maybe they need his healing in their souls, maybe they need to, to hear his voice or see a vision or whatever. Maybe they just simply need to come to know him for the first time. Simply ask Jesus together with the rest of the church once a day to display his compassion towards them in ways they can see. The other person we're asking you to pray for is a person you don't know. Just one of those faces in the crowd. In each of your bulletins, uh, there should have been a slip of paper when you walked in with an address. That's the address of a house near where we meet here, near where many of us had to park today. We don't know most of the people in the neighborhood. They're just part of the crowd, and that's the point. Jesus loves them because they too are sheep without a shepherd. Jesus cares for them, has compassion on them because they need him, need his teaching, need his healing, just like we do. So alongside that name you know, we're asking you each day to enter into Jesus' compassion for that house number and whoever lives there. Now this is not gonna be a bait and switch. This is not gonna be something where we come back in Lent and say, and now it's time to walk up to their door. <laughs> you may not be the one to meet their need. Just pray. Just pray that Jesus' compassion would be made known to them. Pray that they would know the love of the Father. Pray that he would be working in their lives in ways that they could know and see. And then just watch. Watch to see what Jesus might do. Because he cares. And he invites us into that care. He longs and yearns, and he invites us into his longing and yearning. And he works. Even when we don't know how to work. Because in him, there is enough. And more than enough. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we confess in this moment that we do not have what it takes. That we wrestle and we struggle with that. But we also confess that you already know. 
and that you are the one who is always meant to fill that spot. Would you free us to receive from you your abundance, your mercy, your compassion? Would you free us to let go of our need to fix it all? so that we might look up and see the ways that you are at work beyond and above anything we could ask or imagine. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen.